Hey everybody, welcome to Harmony Hills Home and Garden. I'm Jenny and we live and garden and bark here in Baltimore, Maryland, Zone 7. Today I thought I would bring you along as I get some things done in the garden. I've got a lot of plants in my driveway, in my plant stash that need to get into the ground. They've been sitting there for a long time. I've been away from the garden a lot this summer as it turns out. And so today I'm hoping to get a lot done. Come with me, let's do some work in the garden. So down here on my driveway, I keep a lot of plants during the season that I've purchased or grown from seed. And uh, I store them here and I keep try to keep them watered uh, until they get planted in the ground. So let me just give you a quick overview of all the things that I still have here. All right, so over here on this side of the driveway, uh, these are my remaining things that I planted from seed. Um, a lot of them have died because they've just been sitting here languishing. Uh, I've got lots of zinnias that have died, basically. In fact, I think this whole tray is zinnias, and you can see how poorly I've treated them. And then over here, lots of things as well. These are amaranth that are on their last legs, saponaria, uh, lemon drop basil. A lot of the basils didn't make it. So these are really, really poor. Um, I have some violas that are pretty much done blooming now. Uh, what is this? I mean, it looks like crabgrass now. It was supposed to be rudbeckia. That is most definitely not rudbeckia. Uh, oh, this is campanula. So... Look at that, it flowered here in the seed tray. I believe this is adoratum. It's not labeled. Uh, and then what else? Um, more Campanula. Balloon flower is another name for it. And then Viola's here. These are some uh, goldenrods that I bought and uh, I need to get them planted. They are so pot bound. They're so pot bound. And this one has actually very nearly died all the way. I got to get it in the ground today. More seedlings of various kinds. And here's some more over here. I believe these are snapdragons. Mix of things. They're dry. They are root bound. They are malnourished. And they've just been languishing here. I've got more to show you though. Over on this side, this is where I still have that spruce tree that I bought last fall, still sitting here in a pot. I still have two of the three dwarf Alberta spruces that I bought at Christmas time. I still have this cryptomeria. This is a globosa nana, I believe, cryptomeria that I got in uh, Raleigh. I don't think I've actually shown you that. I took a trip to Raleigh uh, two or three weeks ago, got that at the farmer's market. Um, this is the Mugo Pine that I got on a really good price from Lowe's. What else did I buy from over here? This is a native honeysuckle vine, another pyracantha, um, a clematis, and then two Maynite salvias to go out front. So the, of the plants that I've purchased, those are the ones I want to focus on today. The rest of these plants are all seedlings that I've grown from seed, and these were for a seedling sale, and these didn't sell. So, uh, you know, I could give them away. Actually, that's probably what I'll do. I'll probably offer them up. If I don't plant them, I'll offer them up on the front sidewalk for anyone who wants them. Oh, I do have a couple more things. These are some flocks and maybe anemones that I did a mail order thing and stuck them in these pots uh, and they're struggling. And then um, looks like I've got some tomatoes left and some peppers left. So just a lot of things. Some of you have commented that I um, am showing a bad example by not taking care of my plants. But I really think, um, I think this is mm, not uncommon. I'm guessing some of you out there also have plants that are still in their containers, whether you started them from seed or bought them at a store or a nursery, uh, and they're still waiting to be planted. I'm not the only one who does this, I know. So what I think I'll show today is my efforts to get some of these things. I'm not going to be able to get them all, but get at least some of these things into the ground. I don't see my bag of biotone anywhere. Where is it? Found it. Now the first thing I'm going to plant is this blue spruce. 
This is a Black Hills Blue Spruce. Like I said, I purchased this last fall, in the fall of 2022, and it's been sitting in this container ever since then. And so I'm gonna give it a nice deep drink of water before I try to plant it. So this is the Black Hills Spruce Picea Glauca Densata. Uh, it wants to live in full sun. I don't have any full sun to give it, so I'm going to give it the best I can. It'll grow much slower in shade than it would in full sun. It might not even grow at all. I don't know, but I want to try to have a blue spruce in the garden. So I'm willing to give this a go. I think I paid $40 for this plant. It's a healthy specimen. It's still healthy, despite the fact that it's been living in this container uh, all through last fall, through the winter, the spring, and now here we are in mid-June. So anyway, so this one uh, grows to be a, a mature size of 20 to 25 feet tall. So a smallish uh, evergreen and then only 10 to 12 feet wide. But again, in my garden where I only have limited amounts of, of sun, I don't think it's going to grow that big. I think it'll stay smaller. This is hardy down to zone three. Now, blue spruces in zone seven, especially the humid middle Atlantic area that we're in here in Baltimore, uh, blue spruces have been dying off in our climate. Um, our long lived blue spruces are actually uh, not adapting well to the more humid environment that we're having, hotter summers, more humid summers. Um, they want to be less humid than we have here. So blue spruces really thrive in the colder temperatures of zone three, zone four, zone five, zone six, and the less humid temperatures. So all that to say that for a $40 investment, I think I'm going to be okay if this is not a terribly long-lived tree. I think it'll provide some uh, blue-colored evergreen interest in the garden, which is what I want. And if it only lives five to 10 years, I will be okay with that. Um, $40, that's not a terrible investment for a five to 10 year investment. So that's my strategy on this. I know this isn't gonna be long lived. I know it's not gonna get to be its full size, but I think that it will give me some enjoyable blue evergreen interest in the garden for the short time that it will thrive here. So that's my thinking on this. Where am I gonna put this? I have a spot picked out just for this. Over here on the side of the garage, um, there's the garage there. This is on the south side of the house, uh, and that's the south hill over there. This area here is kind of a mishmash. It's kind of a plant graveyard. It's kind of a, all kinds of messy things looking going on here. But um, this used to have a walnut tree right about where that pot is. Um, and two years ago, we had that walnut tree taken out. Uh, because it was too close to the house. Um, in fact, we still have some trees that are too, ho too close to the house, but I haven't gotten those down yet. Anyway, so this black walnut tree was here and now it is not. And uh, instead I have an azalea here, but the azalea keeps getting eaten by the deer. So you can see maybe that the azalea is just mostly sticks with green leaves down in the center of it, but the deer keep eating the green leaves that are at the ends of the stem. So I'm gonna take out this azalea and put the blue spruce right here in this spot. This is a container that used to have uh, mint in it. Um, I mean, this is the old mint. We had such a hard winter that the mint didn't survive the winter, except I do see the tiniest little bit of green growth in here. So I am I see one right here, this is a weed. Uh, and here's one right here, just the tiniest little bit of mint greenery coming back finally. So I am going to move this container. I'm going to keep this container and hope that the mint will regrow um, because I love having mint, but I don't love having mint in the ground. As you know, it can take over, literally take over a whole area in your garden if you don't contain it. So I like having it in, in this container. So let's see if we can get this to grow, but I'm gonna scoot it away. I'm not gonna lift it because it's too heavy. I'll find a new spot for that later. So all right, this is my stone that the mint was sitting on. Okay, this is the azalea that's gonna come out. You can see the top bits of it are dead. A lot of it's dead. 
Um, some of it's still growing, but the deer keep eating it, so it's just going to come out. I think, yeah, see how poorly rooted in it was. Not at all, so... This was transplanted two times since I've lived here. It's lived in two different locations before this. And so it just, it's just a casualty of war in the garden, war with the deer. All right, so this is gonna be my location for the blue spruce. Now, if the blue spruce actually does get 10 to 12 feet wide, it's okay because this bed is 10 feet wide and there's plenty of room here. If it gets that big out onto the lawn, we'll deal with that then. But uh, for now, I think I don't anticipate it actually getting that big. And uh, so this is gonna be a nice little focal point spot for it. It is bone dry. We didn't have any rain between I think May 3rd and June 12th, I think. So five or six weeks with zero rain. And then on June 12th, we got about, I don't know, a tenth of an inch. So we really have not had moisture this year. So as I dig this hole, I am going to definitely soak this hole before I plant the tree in it. I'm gonna fill the hole with water, let it soak down in, and only after the water has really soaked in will I uh, put the tree in. I'm encountering some old roots and some current roots. The old roots from the tree that used to be here and the current roots from this walnut tree right over there. Everywhere in my garden I deal with tree roots, so I try not to hurt them, but sometimes Sometimes I do end up cutting roots, unfortunately. All right, I don't have to go terribly deep. I think my pot's only about 10 inches deep. All right, I think that's probably deep enough. Let me go get my hose, fill the hole with water. Now I have to tell you, these boots that I'm wearing are, um, they're new boots from High C, and uh, I love them. They're, you know, just over ankle high. They're so sturdy, and they've got great grip on the bottom. Cute little floral pattern on them. I actually have a discount code if you would like to buy yourself a pair of these boots. I'll put the discount code in the description box of this video down below. And so you can go out and get yourself some of these boots. I love them. I'll tell you, I did size up. I normally wear a nine or a nine and a half inch shoes. I got a 10 in these and they're perfect. They stay on really nicely. They don't flop around on my feet, but there's plenty of room in the toe box. Also, I have a problem with my feet with um, arch support. I need arch support in my shoes. And these have just enough. I will say that the other high C boots that I have have a little bit more arch support in those than these do in these, but this is just enough to keep my feet happy as I'm working in the garden. So I highly, highly recommend these high C boots. These are uh, full on waterproof. They are very warm, I'll say. So in the hot summer, uh, that's a con to using them in the summer, but the great thing about them is they do protect my feet. Now they're not gonna, they're not steel toed or anything like that. So they're not gonna protect you in a construction setting. Um, but uh, they do take good care of my feet in all kinds of terrain. And especially because I garden on a hill, my entire garden is on a hill. The grip on them is really nice, especially in wet grass, which we never have because we haven't had any rain. Anyway, you get my meaning. The grip on them is really good. Um, and uh, so, yeah, get yourself some of these high C boots. They're really good. All right, let me finish filling the water. Okay, this is a good sign. I uh, put about six inches of water in the bottom of this hole already, and it has already soaked in. So that means this is gonna have good drainage, but that also means that I'm gonna to have to put this on irrigation so that the tree survives its first year in the ground without, um, you know, make sure it has enough water. But anyway, I'm gonna to try to fill this hole with water and let it soak in.
So actually it was difficult to fill the hole because the soil is draining pretty quickly, which is different from most parts of my garden. So I'm gonna just give this a few minutes, let that water soak all the way down into the soil so that I know that when I plant my tree that the soil surrounding it is already nice and moist given the drought that we've been having. And while we're waiting for that, uh, this is not a fashion channel, but this is a gardening channel. And I wanted to share with you some things that I have found indispensable in my garden. And that is these clothes that I'm wearing. These are from Duluth Trading Company. These are some of their gardening shorts. This is a sun shirt that they sell. And um, I have been wearing Duluth Trading gardening shorts. I have a pair of their bib overall shorts. And then I have two pairs of these just short, I have skorts and shorts, and they are fabulous. They're covered in pockets, so you can always find pockets to put things in, especially those overalls. Oh my gosh, I have them in the periwinkle blue or whatever. I don't know what they named the color. They are so, so convenient. They've got pockets and hooks and loops everywhere. I could load myself down with all kinds of tools and supplies and gloves and strings and seeds and all the things and not ever have to schlep back to the garage to get the thing that I forgot. So the Duluth Trading Company um, products, I am a big believer. I think they're geared mostly toward the farming community. They're from Minnesota, from Duluth, Minnesota, and um, they just have such good products. Sun shirt, SPF 50, it's wicking, t takes the heat, sweat away from you, cools you down when there is a sweaty environment. Today is not really all that hot, but um, I use it for the sun protection also, and it's nice and long, and if I chose to tuck it in, it wouldn't come untucked, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not a fashion expert. I don't care what I look like in the garden. I care how I function in the garden. This shirt keeps me cool. These pants dry quickly, covered in pockets, comfortable to wear big thumbs up. Also, these gloves I got from Amazon, this hat I got from Amazon. Links for everything I'm wearing, my entire ensemble, will be in the description box down below. That's all I'll say about that. But in general, if you ever wonder, where'd you get that shirt, Jenny? Or where'd you get that hat, Jenny? I try to put the links down below in case you're interested. Now, back to our regularly scheduled programming. How's our hole doing? It is draining out. So let me go get my tree. Okay, good planting practices. When you plant a tree, you do not want to add a bunch of amendments to your, soul, to your hole. Here's the logic on that. If you um, fill your hole with yummy compost and great organic matter that's different from the soil that surrounds, then the roots that are in the pot will go out into that compost. They'll say, ooh, this is nice and comfy. And then they'll hit up to the wall of the hole that has a different kind of soil, whether it's more clay or more sandy or more loamy with just less um, organic material. The roots will stay in the compost and not venture out as quickly into the surrounding soil. So it's much better, and science has backed this up with research, it's much better now instead of amending the soil in your hole, you backfill with the native soil, that's the same soil around, and then top dress with more organic matter. And then what will happen is the roots will go out into the native soil because that's all you have offered it. And then the organic matter that you put on top will interact with the soil microorganisms and that organic matter will be turned into the soil by the worms and the insects and the microbes and et cetera. And that is uh, going to be better for your plant in the long run. So no soil amendments into the planting hole for a tree. And uh, I am going to use some Biotone starter fertilizer and that will uh, help the roots get established. What happens is the mycorrhizae in the, in the Biotone, they become activated and they interact with the roots, they actually create more pores and holes and more fibers on the roots themselves so that there's more surface area for water and nutrients to be taken up by the plant. So mycorrhizae in the biotone helps the root development and I am not putting in any soil amendments, just this organic uh, uh, fertilizer. So, and my water is very nearly all the way down in the hole. So um, this time I'm gonna go ahead and add the fertilizer. This is a, not a synthetic, so this will not burn the roots of your plant. This is organic. And I just am going to eyeball it. I'm gonna put in 
two handfuls. Like that. Ta-da. Okay. All right, so even though this has been sitting in the pot for quite a while, it is not terribly root bound. Uh, the roots are not uh, girdling or anything like that. So I'm gonna plant this so that this soil level is at the native soil level. I don't wanna bury it deeper than it is. If anything, I'll leave it high, but actually I'm not gonna leave it high. I'm just gonna put it even with the surrounding ground. And then I just need to make sure that it's vertical in its hole. Now this particular trunk happens to have a crook in it. So um, I want the leader from like here up to be vertical. Yep. All right. So there we go. So now I'm just going to backfill. This soil is super dry. So I will definitely be watering it in well after I put it back in here. The soil underneath, surrounding the hole, is now nice and moist. But the soil that I dug out is super dry. I'm just um, meeting the top level of the pot, the soil that was in the pot. I'm making that even with the ground around it. There we go. So now that's even with the level ground. Uh, but because this is on a hill, I would like to make a moat kind of around it, like a donut out away from the pot. This mulch is a couple of years old, and so it's kind of become a little bit, I don't know, dried out on top and turned itself into like sheets. You can see that the fungus in the soil is breaking it down. That's all good. It's all desirable. Break that up a little bit. Pull oh, some of that soil up there. You know what? Let me go get a tool. It'll be more easy. This poor, this poor flower bed has been so neglected this year. I've done absolutely nothing over here this year. So it's in dire need of care. I'm just pulling this top crust of mulch up and trying to chop it up a little bit. Um, that'll, I don't know, look a little better maybe. I mean, gosh, this is, uh, there's nothing wrong with this other than it kind of, um, the, the, the fungus that's in the soil, that's good for your soil, uh, that breaks down your mulch has kind of taken a life of its own and formed this crust of this mulch here. So... I think I can get this back on. And I saw there were crows over here, like, I don't know, 10 or 15 crows digging through this crust of mulch yesterday. So there's some organism living in this soil that the crows like. All right, so I'm making a moat around the tree that uh, hopefully, if we ever get any more rain, will... Uh, Hold the water up uh, at the at the base of the tree and not let it uh, run down the hill quite as quickly in rain runoff. It's not going to be perfect. I mean, there's no doubt that the rain will certainly go through the bottom of that mulch and just run down the hill. But hopefully, this mulch will serve to keep the water in place just a little bit longer than it would have if the mulch wasn't there. So 
water this guy in. All right. I'm just going to cover the earth, cover the soil, but I'm not going to cover up to the trunk of the tree. I'm just going to spread this mulch so that it covers the soil just enough to help with uh, moisture retention, but I'm not taking the mulch all the way up to the tree. You, you want a mulch donut, not a mulch volcano. That is a job well done, I believe. So uh, I'm gonna take the tag off and then regroup in my mind. Think about what is my next planting task? You know what, I haven't shown you this garden bed in a while, let me show you what's all in here. These are the trees that the Arbor Day Foundation gave to me. There were 12 of them, and now I think there are four of them that are still alive. Oh well, this is why they say don't put them in pots, because inevitably they'll get neglected and die. Got some hostas, old daffodil foliage, hellebore foliage, more hostas, spiderwort that I've been trying to remove, but it's still there, and I love it except that it flops like that. I've got this uh, bishop's weed over here, also called snow on the mountain that uh, my uh, family member gave to me. And some people were concerned that it's invasive, but this has been in here now for two years and this is all the bigger it's gotten. So I'm not worried about it taking over anywhere anytime soon. Uh, more hostas back here. Amazingly, the deer have not eaten them. I wonder if it's because uh, of the gout weed near them. Bishop's weed is another name for it. Bishop's weed, gout weed, um, snow on the mountain. So these hostas are still here. And then I had beautiful foxgloves here. Uh, I don't know if they've made it onto the channel when they were blooming, but they were gorgeous. Now I'm letting them go to seed and I'll shake the seeds out onto the soil here and see if we get any regrowing. And then up this way, I have done nothing in here. There were daffodils and now there are hostas. Hostas have been munched back once and they're recovered. So maybe the deer will come and munch them again. Maybe they won't. I don't know. So that's this. There's the tree in its place. I think it's going to be a nice spot for an evergreen. Overall, I'm really happy with the placement of this blue spruce. I think if it grows in this location to its full size, it'll still be good. 20 to 25 feet tall and it would grow up roughly to about there on the house but uh, it's unlikely to grow that big. And so it'll just nice, probably be just a nice accent here on this corner. So I'm happy with that placement. I went ahead and cleaned up a bunch of things. I weeded, took out all the baby cherry trees, took out all the English ivy that I could find. And then I uh, took out all the spiderwort. I'm keeping the roots of it to replant elsewhere. So that cleaned up that back area. And I've got hellebores and hostas in here. I think over time I'll probably turn this into a hellebore garden um, and take the hostas and put them inside the fence so that the deer don't bother them as much. But for now, I think it's pretty good. Um, I have some uneven terrain over there. And of course, this is a working area of the garden. This is where we park. So this isn't the most beautiful place in the, in the garden that we have, but um, I think it looks better now than it did an hour ago, so I'm happy with that. In the mint container, I have this one little guy that I'm hoping will grow back and become a beautiful mint plant. Fingers crossed. All right, next on the docket, I'm going to be planting this cryptomeria. This is, I believe, Globosa nana which means that it's a dwarf uh, globe-shaped cryptomeria in the space where this green hosta is right now. This green hosta is hosta lancifolia. It is a really basic hosta, a workhorse, an iron, cast iron plant. Not really a cast iron plant. There is a plant called cast iron plant. But this uh, hosta lancifolia is all over our garden. In fact, um, it is the very first hostas that we had here. They were here when we moved in. And I've been spreading them around to use as filler in spaces where I didn't have a permanent idea of what kind of plant I wanted. So um, now that I do have an idea of what kind of plant I want, I'm gonna be putting this globosa, uh, this globosa 
Nana Cryptomeria into this space. So I probably will just offer this hosta up to my neighbors on curbside in case anybody wants it. I don't really have any more space where I need to put it. May Actually, you know what? Maybe I'll put it down by the lower patio where I still have empty space down there. That's probably what I'll do. So I'm going to take this out and put this in. I'm using the same practices that I used on the blue spruce, so I'm not going to go step by step on it. I'm just going to get it done. Next on the docket, I have this clematis that I bought uh, several, hmm, probably a month and a half ago now. Part of it has dried out, bad gardener Jenny, um, but some of it is still alive. This is the Raguchi clematis. This was the one that has the small purple bells, which is one of my favorite flower shapes and forms. Uh, Raguchi clematis is a multi-stemmed non-vining clematis with indigo purple bell-shaped flowers that dangle on a narrow black stems from late spring until fall. A cross between a shrubby clematis and a vining clematis, this free spirit will ramble over shrubs or through the garden unless tied to upright support. Grows eight, six to eight feet tall with support. So for support, what I'm planning to do is use this black metal uh, scrolly viney trellis and the fence. I'm going to put it on the fence roughly in the center right here. That means I need to move out some plants that I have in here right now. What I have in here right now is some garden phlox. This variety is called mini pearl. It's a wonderful garden phlox. It is an early one. It's already bloomed out. So I was waiting to plant this clematis here until after this finished blooming because I didn't want to ruin the blooms from this clump of phlox. So now I'm going to dig this out. I will cut it back down and when I replant it somewhere else, if I'm lucky, it'll bloom again for me this season. I also have some uh, sedum autumn joy over there. I'll probably move that out as well. My long-term plan for this entire bed is to turn it into an herb garden. That's why I moved my bronze fennel into here, but that's the only herb I have in here so far. Uh, and this clematis isn't an herb, obviously. But in the long term, this will be an herb garden. But for now, I'm just going to put this clematis here, take out this phlox. Again, I need to water everything really deeply because it has been so dry here. This clump actually is connected to a clump that's on the other side of the fence. So I'm just going to trim it here. I'm 
Now, if I was really worried about it coming back through the fence, I would go around to the other side of the fence and trim the rest of, or cut, dig the rest of that out. However, I think it would be really charming and pretty if it does grow back through here and mingles with the clematis. The clematis will climb up with my encouragement onto the trellis and maybe onto the fence flats and then the flocks could mingle with it at the base. So I think that would be pretty. So I'm actually not going to try to remove it from the other side. All right, let me get out this English ivy. Don't want it in here. Yeah, that's a lot. And Lily of the Valley from the other side. I'll let that stay. All right, where's the center? Let's see. One, two, three. That means the center is right here. Might be better off if I water this soil. It'll be easier to get that in there. All right, now we plant this clematis in here. We're going to water this now because I see that the root ball is not drenched all the way through. Now this soil is wet, so I am not going to compact it. I'm going to try to keep it loose. Do not want to create a lack of oxygen around the roots. Keeping your soil loose like this when it's wet will help it stay aerated underneath. If you compact wet soil, it closes up all those air pockets, those little minuscule air pockets, and uh, suffocates your plants. So you don't wanna do that. All right, now let me see if I can get this wooden trellis off of here. In the past, I've had success just picking them apart. So I got all the crossbars off and now I can just pull the verticals up and off. Undo this little tape here. So with a little help from me, hopefully it will scramble up this trellis and give us pretty purple bells on the trellis and across the fence over time. I am losing my water down the hill, so let me see if I can create some sort of moat. I'm gonna have to re-mulch in here. My mulch is a couple of years old and it's thinned out over time. Yeah, that's better. Now I've got a moat going on, so the water will stay at the roots instead of running down the hill. I'll put some mulch over top of here to prevent moisture loss. And then also I'll be planting other things at the base uh, around this so that the roots of this plant are protected from sun. They really don't like to have hot roots. Heads in the sun, feet in the shade is the adage for clematis. So, well, I made a mistake. I laid these uh, phlox plants bare root down on the soil here, and then I went and took a break for lunch. And so now I'm back about an hour later and they've dried out and they've really started to wilt. But I'm gonna do my best to get them into the ground, get them watered, trim off the excess at the top so that they can not worry about uh, managing and maintaining all of this foliage. Instead, it'll be able to focus on photosynthesizing with the leaves that I leave and focus on its root development. Now, this mini pearl phlox is wonderful. It spreads, but it's not a thug. It gives you nice growth over time. It, so if I put this clump here, I anticipate that next year it'll be about double the size and in the third year it would be, you know, triple or quadruple the size that it is right now. So I think this is gonna be a good spot for this clump. And then the major big clump, 
I'm going to put over there where I have a big hole. I do have irrigation lines under here, so I make sure I don't hit them. some spots out here in the front flower border on the north side of the front yard to put in those mini pearl flocks. I've got two clumps here in the front and then one clump on the back side of this border near the stone pathway. And those, those are going to blend and um, repeat the clumps of mini pearl flocks that I have already on the south side as well. So that gives me the white across the whole front, not just on the one side. So I'm super happy about that. I think my camera is just about out of battery and needs to be recharged. And honestly, I need to be recharged. So I'm going to call this a day. Thank you so much for joining me in the garden today as I got some things out of the stash into the ground and then transplanted things as a domino effect. I hope that you're having a wonderful day in your garden too. Let me know in the comments below what's happening in your garden. What are you doing? Are you finished? Ugh, bugs. Have you finished planting? Are you still working on getting your things into the ground? Let me know what's going on. I hope I'll be back more often, folks, but I gotta tell you that life is busy and it's just looking still busy for the coming summer as well. I'll be here as often as I can. Until then, have a wonderful day in your garden and I'll see you again, hopefully soon. Bye-bye.